All right, everyone. Um, so we are here to discuss the history and evolution of Bitcoin mining. Um, it's come a long way in the 13 years since Satoshi launched the network. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing to, to, I guess, be here now in what might be one of the larger uh, stages I've seen dedicated to Bitcoin mining at any sort of conference. Uh, I feel like most mining discussions have been just uh, on Twitter, uh, in spats, and uh, really just sort of behind closed doors. So it's awesome to, to be here today. We have some really t talented uh, panelists to come and uh, give us some history of Bitcoin mining. I guess we'll just we'll start with some intros, then we'll move into uh, about a 20 minute discussion, and then lastly we'll wrap up with uh, 20 minutes of Q&A so that you all can ask some questions around the history of Bitcoin mining and where we think it might be going into the future. Uh, I guess I'll start. My name is Drew Armstrong. I'm president and COO of Cathedra Bitcoin. Uh, we're a publicly traded off-grid Bitcoin mining company, uh, but I've been working in this space for uh, basically about three years now. Before that, I was part of the founding team at Galaxy's uh, mining business line. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll first pass it off to, to Marshall if you want to give yourself some background. Sure. What's up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> Name's Marshall. Uh, I'm head of architecture for Rhodium Mining. I've uh, been in the space since 2010, uh, met a lot of great people, uh, made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot, and uh, yeah, now we run, I guess, 100 megawatts of immersion, 25 megawatts of air mining, and we're expanding uh, this next month, 225 additional megawatts of immersion online, so uh, yeah, been in the space a long time, seen a lot of changes, and uh, cried a lot, so. <laughs> My name is Mike Hamilton. I'm uh, chief, research, chief research officer at uh, Grid Infrastructure. Uh, we're a, a large-scale industrial uh, miner uh, focused on uh, clean energy and, uh, uh, and mining uh, Bitcoin with it. I uh, used to be a chip designer um, uh, in my early early career, and uh, you know found my way into uh, Bitcoin mining. Um, I guess 2016, uh, I got orange pilled. Uh, and then uh, about three years ago, uh, left, uh, left the corporate world to start doing it full time. Amanda Cavallari, CEO of Digital Reserve Energy. Uh, we mine off grid in the Rocky Mountains, uh, so stranded in flare gas. And then we also work with partners on site selection uh, for on grid in the Rockies. And I'm the new kid on the block. I just was getting frustrated that we couldn't move faster in the Rockies after the checks it. So that's how. How our company came about. We were trying to you know, create jobs um, in the Rocky Mountain region, and we think this is the best way to do it. The checks it. I like that. It's the first time I've heard that branding. Um, <laughs> I guess for, for those who might not be familiar, I think that refers to the, the great hash rate migration from China after the regulatory changes in the summer of 2021. Is but that I what guess. We're calling it checks it? Checks, checks it. it. Griffin Habby. We'll give him that. Problem. You heard it here yeah. first. Uh, okay, I guess let's let's uh, maybe start at the beginning when we think about the history of Bitcoin mining. Marshall, you've been here the longest. Uh, OG BTC himself. Uh, I think you started in 2010. I mean, just tell us about what it was like when you first started getting into mining and how you've seen it change. Sure. Like when I first started mining, I didn't actually know if it was legal because, like, in the Constitution, it says, "Oh, you can't make your own money," and I'm like, "Uh, don't know." <laughs> what I'm doing. So I, I was very quiet for a long time. Um, and, you know, mining on a laptop and it was purely a, this is a cool nerdy thing. Like, oh, my, my graphics card and CPU can make nerd money. <laughs> it was very much the, the reason to mine early days. Um, and then, you know, it was just a purely nerdy endeavor. And then after that, <clears throat> you know, we moved to graphics cards. Actually, could, could I interrupt? Yeah. So when you're saying uh, you know, you're just you doing some money printing yourself. What exactly did that look like tangibly? Like your first mining setup? What was the infrastructure? Where were you doing it? Mm -hmm. Where was the power? It was a laptop and a desktop in my apartment. And uh, yeah, there was no great tooling, no good software. It was just, I mean, you couldn't watch YouTube to learn. It was just bashing your fingers on a keyboard and rolling your face around so you could kind of figure out, you know, stratum, the mining protocol wasn't a thing. You had to use Git work proxies and all these other, and you couldn't even use a pool at the time. So uh, thank God Slush launched a pool because that made life a lot easier. And, and if it was so uh, just like, call it jerry-rigged, I guess, you're just using your laptop, where did you, where did you even first get the idea to mine Bitcoin? Sure. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, we had lunch. We were working on an iPhone app at the time. 
He was like, dude, I was checking out the deep web last night and I found this thing. I was like, okay. He was like, it's like math problems with your computer and it makes like these nerdy blocks that you can send to other people. I was like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just kind of like how it started. And you know, then graphics cards began to be like the main thing to mine. And I would get on eBay and I was so short-sighted. My only goal was, I was a gamer, huge gamer. It's like, oh, I can buy graphics cards from Craigslist for 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, and I could pay them off, and I'll just have hordes of graphics cards for free. <laughs> that was the, the short-sighted initial ramp up, max the power off in your apartment until your girlfriend says, get out, because she can't plug in a hairdryer without <laughs> nuking the whole apartment. A building manager complaining that the people living above you can't cool their apartment. Um, so those are the early growing pains. Um, can, what year is the, the GPU transition that you underwent? Yeah, so from 2010 and 11, it's, it's mostly like whatever you can get a hold of. And then a lot of people on forums and stuff started making the drivers for graphics cards around you know late 11, 12. And then in the 13, FPGAs had a very short stint. Uh, and then on into ASICs in 2013 pretty heavily. So, um, yeah, the, the early days were very much uh, don't get kicked out of your apartment, don't get divorced. And even now, my now wife has um, PTSD from fan noises. So when we moved to our house uh, in Houston a few years ago, I tried to just, like, plug in a box in the garage. She was on the other side of the house, and she heard it, and she's just like, not again, no. <laughs> so it was a whole, it, it, she, I, she has PTSD from So it's so a question for you, how much of home mining strategy, because uh, I know it impacted me, <laughs> how, how have wives of nerdy Bitcoin miners over the years affected home mining strategy? They, they force scale, I would say. <laughs> Uh, I, think, I think the entire immersion industry has, has wives to thank yes. uh, <laughs> for uh, uh, wives and kids. My wife literally started a Facebook group called the Desperate Bitwives. That's great. <laughs> Not kidding. Uh, it's still a thriving community now. So if you're a suffering uh, PTSD or uh, you check it out. The real MVPs. Yeah. Uh, one, one last question before, before we transition to this next stage. So call it 2012, 2013, when you know, the first ASIC comes out in 2013. Step change in efficiency. Can you bridge what bridge the gap from say 2013 to say 2017? Sure. Which is when most people maybe started getting more into mining mm -hmm. over in an industrial way. So in the very early days, we we're running on like very inefficient process nodes that were not industry standard. So you know you had uh, Butterfly Labs, I think, was a 64 nanometer chip, and there was it was like every three months something new would come out, and so it was it, very much an arms race. And you're, you get really good at timing the market, timing the development cycles, getting to know everybody so you, you can get the new stuff and then sell it before anybody knows that the new stuff's even out. And now it's much less psychotic, uh, for better or worse. Um, people think a two-year release window is really hardcore now. Uh, three months was nosebleed at the time. So that, that's like the main shift beyond the technology. It's just like the release cycles and the iteration improvements come a lot less frequently, thankfully, so you can scale a lot better. And, and for background, for people who might not be fami as familiar with the history of mining, I think it is those quick release cycles, among other factors, that led to China dominating yeah. mining for so long because, you know, if, it, if there's a three-month, call it useful life of, of machine before it's far less efficient than the current generation, having it shipped across the world is far less competitive than finding somewhere to plug it in locally right next to the source of the, the, this hardware. Um, uh, early days, the, the, if you, even if they would ship them, the customs guys would take them out of the box, mine them for a month, and then put them back in the box <laughs> and ship them. So you weren't even fighting manufacturers at that point. It was just like customs guys, oh, it's stuck in customs, I don't know. It's a real shame. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I guess let's, let's take it to this next uh, phase then. Mike, when, when did you first start getting into Bitcoin mining? What did the, what did the whole industry look like at that point? Yeah, so I, I got into it in late 2016. Um, uh, I got orange-pilled by, by Trey, uh, our, our, our CEO and, and founder at Grid. Uh, I came into it from the, uh, from the nerdy aspect. Like, I didn't come into Bitcoin from like, the economic policy or fiscal policy or, or freedom. I came into it because, uh, you know, like I said, I was a chip designer. 
uh, you know, nerd to the core, and it was just super fun to take. Uh, uh, there was still some GPU stuff. I don't think I'm allowed to say the other things that I was doing with with the GPUs uh, uh, at, at the Bitcoin conference. But uh, so I had a couple of S9s uh, at the time, and, and and home mining was still uh, was still a big deal. And in fact, cloud mining we haven't even really talked about. You know, the cloud industry was uh, was still pretty uh, prevalent in uh, uh, in 2016. Having to go write a Fifty thousand dollar check and not seeing you know any of that hash go live for you know eight nine ten months um, uh, and so that's sort of where the industry was. There were still a lot of home miners. Uh, and there's still you know it, even more now, but uh, it was definitely more you know, seemingly uh, a sort of a home project uh, even even in in the in the 2016 uh, in 2017. Makes sense. And so. Then you joined, when did you join Grid again? I joined Grid in 2019. 2019. So I'm curious, in those, how have, how have what you've seen um, as an industry, like how has the industry changed from when you say you started and were familiar with Trey and what he was doing in 2017, 2018, 2019? Fast forward today, you know, you all just went public in the last six months via SPAC, uh, a pretty large SPAC at that. So what, what was that evolution like from, from your point of view? Yeah, I mean it's been you know it's been a, a heck of a heck of a wild ride um, from you know I, I too had uh, my home set up and, and my wife uh, harassing me about the heat uh, and the and the noise um, and sort of transitioning from that sort of home mining uh, you know industry I mean I think the, the the primary areas where things have changed you've got uh, you know custom firmware that unlocks all sorts of new things uh, and really just the entire software ecosystem the proliferation of all the different pools. Uh, different payout methods. Um, you know, uh, you've got the, uh, like I said, the, the, the software support infrastructure managing these, you know, devices. Obviously, you know, uh, you know ASICs are a whole lot easier to manage. Uh, they're a lot simpler than uh, than sort of the GPU rigs, which are, you know, at least for me, a spaghetti mishmash of, you know, 15 different brands and some from China, some from, you know, local, you know, local OEMs. Uh, and so it's sort of this entire industry is sort of streamlined as the ecosystem around it has grown, uh, not, not unlike Bitcoin in general with, you know, Lightning and all the you know, layer two protocols and all. So it's it's really just been a, a broader ecosystem of support uh, to make it more available. Um, and then of course you have, uh, you know, the the geopolitical narrative around you know ESG um, and uh, green energy and renewables and and the intermittency. And so the, the sort of intersection of uh, energy and Bitcoin mining coming together uh, uh, has been, I think, a, a big uh, a shift over the last two, three years uh, in, in driving that base load that helps to uh, subsidize and, and incentivize development of, of alternative energy sources. Um, so yeah, it's been a, a super interesting path um, uh, and journey uh, you know, over the last two, three, four, five years. Yeah, and I guess you also, um I've really seen firsthand the change in hardware over that useful life. I mean, I think that's kind of a common thread here is as the hardware is changing over time, that's just changing the way the whole industry works. Obviously, you guys are at the frontier of that perhaps next phase of hardware evolution with Intel now uh, producing Bitcoin mining chips. Um, Last, que uh, last question before we, we go to Amanda and maybe look more at the future and, and kind of the, the current state of mining. What was it like in 2018, 2019, um, when you, you started, yeah, I guess your relationship with hardware is very different when you were first getting into it than Marshall's. Um, how, how has even just that hardware market changed over the last four years? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's been, it's been interesting to see both the, the longevity of, of the S9. I mean, S9s are still plugged in and still I mean, was it 2014, 2013 when S9s came out, and they're still running. the The death of the S9 has been, you know, uh, you know, uh, forecasted. I don't know how many. I don't know how many times. It's uh, died almost more than Bitcoin. Yeah. 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 The, the prophecy the, long foretold. Yes, the uh, the S9 unplugging, in, or I don't know whatever you want to call it, but. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's been interesting with how the original sort of form factor, the tube, you know, the shoebox form factor has, you know, uh, I think interestingly, uh, interestingly, hasn't evolved as fast as the actual underlying technology inside the the chips and just the the you know the silicon technology, you know, getting down to you know seven nanometer now five nanometer uh, with with some of these chips that you know the XPs and some of the Bitmain stuff, um, and I think we're starting to see more of a. Uh, as the industrial scale mining has grown, 
those form factors start to be a little more challenging. Um, you know, and you're starting to see alternative, you know, folks like Marshall and, and, and those guys doing, you know, large scale immersion uh, to, you know, minimize some of the heat, uh, you know, the heat impacts, especially as the technology, st uh, as the semiconductor stack has gone down uh, in, in size, they become more sensitive to temperature and environmental factors. And so uh, we're definitely seeing that shift to uh, both, uh, you know, both more of an industrial scale form factor uh, industrial scale options, uh, but What's at the same the time, Intel box look like. Please do tell. <laughs> Marshall it, fishing it, for it MMPI looks, on stage. Looks, I'm trying to get that the alpha <laughs> the black up front. box, Marshall. It, it, it's it, black. It's a black box. Yeah. It looks like a box. <laughs> great, great. It has uh, uh, eight corners. <laughs> um, it's made of metal. Okay, got it. Um, it has some <laughs> chips inside. Thanks. And you know, you know what it does? It mines Bitcoin. Great. You heard it here first. <laughs> Intel comes out with Bitcoin miner that mines Bitcoin in a box. Um, Break it, breaking news. <laughs> someone call CoinDesk. Okay. Um, Amanda, you entered the space more recently um, than, than Marshall and Mike. Give us, like, what was your perception of Bitcoin mining when you first entered into it? Sure. So, um my background, I came into this, this world through privacy and then worked with uh, funds, so hedge and venture funds, uh, mostly abroad before COVID. So then COVID happened, I'm like, what the hell do I do? So uh, just, I think last January, started listening in on Clubhouse to these like OG miners that were talking about, you know, what was going on, the state of the industry, and I was just curious, right? Mining frankly, has always intimidated me. It's very, it's like a, you're playing like five games at once when you're mining. You have to have the site, the operations, the cost of the machines, you know, all of these, the power factor, the ESG narrative, like you're constantly having to play like four or five D chess. And it's, so it took me a while to think, okay, well maybe I can actually figure this out. Um, so I wasn't planning to ever be a miner. We were, there were, um, I've done a lot with the state of Wyoming around workforce development. They have a big brain drain issue. So these kids graduate college and they don't have jobs, like future oriented jobs in the state of Wyoming. So they're going to Denver, Seattle. And to me, I'm like, this is, this doesn't, like there's a mismatch here. Uh, this is a state that generates an immense amount of energy. There are wind projects, for example, that can't get transmission lines to California to get off the ground. There's a nuclear project that's going up. I think it's a like 500 megawatt project. And yeah, nuclear, right? There we go, Wyoming. Um, and so, you know, it's just seeing all these factors and trying to bring some of the miners to the state um, during the Chexit, right? So right after and, and spent a lot of time in the summer looking for sites and like doing this pro bono. And it was just so frustrating. I was like, it's right here. It's right here. And so that's how I got into it. Um, partnered up with a former landman and an engineer. Um, and we just started figuring it out. And I think, you know, the wisdom from what, what you all would share, you know, Amanda Fabiano, Drew, AJ with Galaxy, they were running like, you know, I think it was like weekly 101s or bi-weekly, I would listen to those, you know, you just kind of soak it in. And, and that's where this is a very big difference between where Marshall started, like being a cowboy basically, to where basically I get a catalyst if I just listen, right? So I think the quality of education is, is amazing. Like people are doing this on their own time. There's no one paying them to do you know, to sit on Twitter spaces and teach, and Sean from Luxor is amazing as well. So um, really got lucky to be caught up to speed and have a little bit of experience in this industry. But you know, you're taking notes, you're like, okay, S9's okay for a period of time, maybe, right? And you're like, S17's no. <laughs> and then you got like, you know, you just start learning bit by bit. And um, I think it's really doing, doing it is, is the most important part because you learn so much on the operation side and you don't learn without, you know, without actually getting in there. You have to break stuff. You have to yeah. break stuff, You've broken some things. No, I think it's a great point. Um, you know, numbers can look one way on an Excel sheet, but the reality is often very different. You skipped a lot of numbers talking about S9s and S17s there. Um, <laughs> there's a, is a large cemetery of failed Bitcoin mining equipment. Um, you come from the traditional hedge fund world, though. 
And I, I think that's a really valuable perspective because Bitcoin mining is a capital intensive business. ASICs are expensive, so is power infrastructure. Um, if Bitcoin mining is going to continue to expand at this rate, there's going to be net new capital inflows uh, that will need to come into the space. What do you think really are the key bottlenecks from some of those traditional asset managers? Really, we're already starting to see it with this rise now of almost like 30 publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies, um, tons of SPACs. You're seeing a lot more interest from institutional investors just from like a yield perspective. Um, what, what do you think really are, are kind of the key bottlenecks and, and what do you think this transition is going to be as mining becomes more and more institutionalized? over the next few years. Yeah, so we kind of took a bet that, you know, maybe the Texans should have a hedge in the Rockies. Texans love to ski anyway, so it's kind of a nice fit, right? Um, for us, you know, I think the more crowded a region gets, the more difficult it's going to be in that region. Doesn't mean impossible and everything's better in Texas. I get it, right? But it would be probably smart to have a hedge in other places. So that's the bet that we took. We're, you know, our team, we're fourth, fifth generation, Rocky Mountains, all of us grew up there, have families there. Um, and so I think for us that regional expertise is really helpful in relationships, frankly, with local communities. But I think that's going to be the bottleneck is how, you know, each state is different, regulated so differently. And it's been really frustrating, frankly, like Wyoming's really fallen behind when it's like right in front of you, you know. Um, so that's been well, it's not for lack of trying. I've it's been on not, several calls with I you. Know. You're just dragging them, kicking and screaming. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So we try, and I think eventually they'll get there, but they have to change how the utilities are regulated, and yeah. that's a big put. That's not going to happen overnight, right? But the the for example, the Wyoming legislation. You know, it's a state with 550,000 residents, so you can actually like, get to know your senators and representatives, and they like really listen. It's just figuring out how to do it to not hurt retail, you know, normal customers, I think yeah. has been a big, a big pushback that we've heard. So. It's difficult to communicate the fact that Bitcoin mining can be symbiotic to a grid and, and can add a ton of value, um, as we're seeing in the great state of Texas. So I'm, I'm looking at the, the time right now. Uh, we'd love to get, to get some Q&A. Um, if anyone has questions, there are two, uh, I believe, two different microphones on each side. So raise your hand if you have a question and one of the Folks will come find you. Great. Looks like we have some hands. We got our first one. Hey, hey. It's uh, Henry from Finland. Thanks for uh, these educating talks. So I uh, just want to quickly ask, you know, how do you see mining and uh, the future regarding demand response uh, management? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I can only speak for the ERCOT ISO. But in general, um, ERCOT's got a lot of products, right, that mining is uniquely suited for. So, you know, you've got CLR, you've got demand response, load response, um, and, and mining when you really understand the inner workings of the machine can, you know, you can do all kinds of things that, you know, uh, a battery storage would do, so fast frequency response, primary frequency response, the, the folks at Lansing are walking around, they're experts in this field. Um, they're, Mining is a unique, large and granular load that uh, I think we're just scratching the surface of all the things we can do to help you know soak grid inefficiencies. Um, a good example that if you guys see the Lantium guys walking around, you should ask. There's a big uh, Comanche Peak had a big transformer blow up I think about a year ago, just 1.3 gigawatts off the grid, and you can see real time. And they might even show you the chart within like a second their clients are responding to that event to help stop the inertia uh, of the frequency kind of like propagating throughout the grid. Uh, and Bitcoin mining is unique in nature that you can make it overclock, you can underclock, you can turn parts of it off, you can you know, keep the fan spinning, keep it hashing, whatever, that is uniquely suited to help grid inefficiencies. So I think you'll see uh, a lot of things kind of play out in the demand response across other ISOs too. Um, I'm just unfamiliar with, with some of the others. One, one thing I'd actually also add to that is just, uh, especially in ISO or RTO markets, uh, we're seeing increased renewables penetration across mm. the world right now. Um, that can introduce a lot of new volatility onto grids. Bitcoin, as a result, you need more demand response or more flexible loads. 
and Bitcoin mining, as Marshall has just elaborated, is, is maybe one of the best tools to help um, basically you know, smooth out that volatility and also subsidize base load generation that will be needed when renewables aren't actually. See a wind turbine not spinning? That's just like a, a wasted opportunity. Or it's in the middle of the night, everybody's sleeping, nobody's using power and the wind's blowing super hard. Yeah. Those, are, those are things that this helps with. Yeah, and I think one of the other interesting aspects is uh, that's super unique about Bitcoin mining is the actual, the, the geographic location, being able to physically go you know, where there's a giant wind farm that needs to get stood up, but you know, the transmission line development is 18 months away, we can come in, drop some containers, and actually take that, you know, take that load you know, right there at the site, and then pack it up and move it when, you know, when that transmission you know, gets, infrastructure gets built and can deliver to the power, uh, to power you know, ACs and, and all, of that, uh, all of those sorts of things. Hi, I'm uh, Mark from Canada. I, uh, I I'm Mark from Canada. I, yeah, I help global business leaders and political leaders with psychedelics and meditation. So I'm also a proud father of two, an 18 and 16 year old, 16 year old daughters, and um, you know I'm a feminist, and I want to ask Amanda. Uh, sorry, Allison. Amanda. Amanda. Sorry, Amanda. Amanda okay. number two. Fabiana's one. I'm two. It's official. <laughs> so you know it's great to see more diversity hopefully more in the, in the space, but what advice can you give to young ladies who are uh, you know, on the cusp of a new era, a new era in, in yeah. money and, and getting involved? Yeah, I'd say like don't sell yourself short, right? I think maybe if I didn't get in my head too much uh, a few years ago, maybe I could have figured this out earlier, right? So I would say that, and then frankly, like I'm a big fan of mentorship, so, you know, it doesn't have to be a woman mentor. It could be men and women. Some of the best mentors I've had have been men, frankly, um, throughout my career. So um, I think mentors are, are huge. Everyone in here should get a mentor, right? Like, I think that's, that's kind of a cheat code for life. Like, if you want to learn about something, find an expert in that. We're, we're really lucky to have people, especially in this community, that are so willing to teach. And, and I've been really fortunate with that, like I mentioned earlier. Um, whether Drew knows it or not, he mentored me, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's far too kind of you. <laughs> Untrue, likely. Um, uh, hey, uh, this is Jeet from Michigan. I uh, recognize Amanda from the stage. How's it going? Um, uh, so we've, uh, when, when we read the paper, we see a lot about there's like limitations on semiconductors. Um, Ford and some of the auto companies are stopping production because of, um, because of limitations in semiconductors. You've got um, some of the uh, chip manufacturers moving to the United States. How has some of this uh, macro stuff uh, impacted the ability of um, ASIC manufacturers to actually like, you know, get, get places in production and kind of uh, changed how you plan going forward? Like you talked earlier about the release cycles uh, impacted your strategy. Could you talk a little bit uh, about how some of this macro stuff is impacting you? Sure, I'll just talk about high level and then Mike can, and, and can talk probably deeper, but it, the auto industry is one that I get a, a lot. So the uniqueness with the auto industry is it's, they're just running on like very old tech, like airbag sensors are like 110 nanometer. They don't make those anymore. It's just like the fabs are calling the companies and they're like, hey, like we shut that down like 10 years ago. Like, and, and so they have to go through this iterative design process again to kind of get caught up with current process technology. So that's a, a completely different problem, in my opinion. Um, beyond that, I mean, there's just supply chain issues across the board. There are literally whole industries springing up to do like supply chain gap filling. There'll companies that'll just buy tons of resistors that are unique to some process and be able to sell them at like a 10x premium down the line. So there's, um, there are issues, but the, the automotive is, in my opinion, slightly removed. Yeah, and I think the, the, the issues are truly are manifesting. I mean, FPGA is a uh, you know, big, big component of, uh, of the control cards for these systems. And just look at the, the, the S19 line that have, there's literally three, maybe even four different control card versions, some with FPGAs, some with uh, so, you know, some ARM processors from different, you know, different manufacturers. Uh, so it, it, there's no question it's a problem, uh, and it, it, it starts to really affect operations uh, when you when you're doing you know a, a you know a 200 megawatt site like like Marshall here, and you're managing you know the sheer number of systems, and you have different control cards. Some have SD slots. Some you have to take the top off to get to the SD slot in the first place. 
uh, I mean, the issues do really trickle all the way down to the site techs actually, you know, touching and, and lifting machines uh, in and out of the racks. Um, yeah, I mean, the issues are there. There's, the, the semiconductor industry is, is fascinating. Um, you know, there, there could be a shortage of some chemical that's only manufactured in, in Japan because uh, they may have more restrictive COVID policies, and all of a sudden that chemical that's used in the actual manufacturing process now trickles down. Uh, and then, of course, you had COVID in the, in the first place. Uh, and the way the, you know, the semiconductor manufacturing business works, when you have these, you have these windows and these allocations that as they shift between the different, the different products that they're, that they're uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, there were times when people were skipping their allocation for a period, and so that literally sets them back six months. And that's six months that they, don't, they didn't have those chips because they didn't have people to package them up or to, or to make whatever products. Um, so it, it's definitely been you know, a, a, a confluence of events uh, you know, over the last several years that has contributed to some of these issues. Even just getting things on a boat uh, from, from China over to, you know, uh, to LA or Long Beach, uh, the two, I think two of the bigger ports, uh, especially for things coming across there. Uh, so yeah, it's just been a total cluster. That's I, a great question, Jude. Yeah, I, I think a subsequent kind of like prong to that question. Um, how does Intel's uh, entrance into the space, how does TSMC building out a factory in Arizona, um, like how do these developments change? Like are you guys optimistic that this ASIC bottleneck will uh, be whittled away by all these new entrants into, into the mining um, ASIC space? Or are you guys short and you think that there will still be friction? Of course, if the bottleneck is eliminated, it's sort of bad for everyone who's a miner because it gets a whole yeah. lot easier to mine. Uh, I mean, yep. un unfortunately, the, the, yeah, miners want to build their infrastructure and then they want global supply chain disruptions <laughs> <laughs> is, is, is how they're incentivized. But um, yeah, what, what are you guys' thoughts? Do you think that this ASIC bottleneck will be whittled away as time goes on? As or? the market cap grows, I think it, it just like the industry in general, like, the market cap for public miners is like 100 billion or something crazy now. It's too small of a market for them to ignore to make commodity grade hardware and have all the other great things like customer support, reliable supply yeah. chains, all these other things we've kind of struggled with over the years. That's what I'm most excited for. Reliable supply chains. What, what a future that would be. Yeah, I mean, I think from a, from a, you know, eliminating the or minimizing the shortage, I mean, I think that will happen over time. Um, but if you're, ta you're talking about standing up a you know five nanometer U.S. fab, uh, you know it's a you know, five ten billion dollar project. That's a you know two three year project, uh, uh, you know timeline. So it's it's not going to be a short term you know solution. Obviously, for strategically, geopolitically, all the other reasons, it's you know it's fantastic to doing it. But the reality is is we're going to be you know in the mining side specifically, we're going to be subject to this for you know for the foreseeable future. Uh, until some of the, you know, again, some COVID restrictions and, and some of that will, will loosen up and some of that will flow out. But then there's other, there's still other issues um, that it, there's, there's so many things that go into the supply chain. Uh, it's such an intricate, uh, you know, mesh. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be a challenge for a while. Amanda, long or short U.S. hardware manufacturing? Ooh. I want to be long. In my heart, I want to be long. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we do it here. Like, so the way I see it, you know, a lot of, I spent a lot of time abroad and, and I think the digital yuan is fascinating, right? You have the Belt and Road Initiative and the digital yuan, the main, you know, one of the best VC investments in the history of investment was from a telecom company in South, South Africa investing in Tencent, which is WeChat, which is now connected to their payments infrastructure and in, all around the world. And so, like the way I see Bitcoin mining and proof of work really is a counter to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative and the digital yuan. I think it brings about, you know, Western values and, and uh, you know, equality and freedom everywhere. And so, like, mining is an amazing first customer um, for energy producers. And I think if we could unlock, like, the energy potential, not just get the stranded energy, but let's think, like, what if this could be a solution in Africa or South Africa or South America, you know, it, over the long term? I think that's really like the mission of Bitcoin. So the more that chips and the hardware can be developed in, you know, stable countries, frankly, so like U.S. Um, would be amazing. I know Austin, there's a lot going on in Austin. So Texas for another W. So, <laughs> we out here. Texas two, everywhere else zero. That's right. 
Um, but that's basically, you know, what I, I think big picture is we need to just get more essential manufacturing in the U.S. And, and we need to get Bitcoin mining in some of these regions uh, to prop up these infrastructure energy projects around the world. Yeah, totally agree. I think, Hi, I think we have time for, oh. Yeah, there's tons of questions. I think we have time for about two more questions. Yeah. Hi there, Adrian here from Janusburg in South Africa. Um, I've read that it's been a concern that quantum computers could one day undermine Bitcoin and other crypto mining networks. But how realistic is that threat? That's a great question. And I'll, I'll give you a less technical reason, and then Mike will probably give you a technical one, and Amanda will probably give you like a very logical one. So in my opinion, you're going to have much bigger fish to fry if quantum supremacy is ubiquitous. Things like airplanes falling out of the sky, uh, your power grid's not working. Like if somebody was able to engineer a quantum computer to attack Bitcoin, there are far bigger, more lucrative things to attack first, which are a much bigger deal. In my opinion, if I have to dodge planes falling out of the sky, I care about Bitcoin a lot less. So, and that's not like a, a, a far-fetched thing, like GPS disruption, you know, TCAS systems on planes, like, Global financial meltdown, period. Internet not working. Like, there's a lot bigger problems that would happen in the age of like a nefarious quantum supremacy actor. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let him drop the mic on that one. <laughs> I want to hear Drew. So I actually think uh, John Newberry, the Bitcoin core dev or former Bitcoin core dev. I think uh, I've heard him talk about this idea where Bitcoin is actually like if someone invented a quantum computer and develop one, how would you really know? With Bitcoin and really with Satoshi's coins, you have the, like a massive economic incentive to develop a quantum computer, but it's also an alarm bell because as soon as someone, as soon as someone moves Satoshi's coins, then potentially um, that's a wake up call. Hey, someone has found a way to break SHA-256, perhaps using a quantum computer. Uh, I don't think it's actually a super realistic concern with Bitcoin because you could always, like I think if it really happens, you could hard fork to a quantum resistant algorithm. And I think, uh, you know, potentially that's a way you can solve that problem. But I think Marshall's totally right. Um, everyone's bank accounts are like meaningless in a world with a quantum computer. Yeah, what, what would you say? Yeah, I would say make friends with your local ranchers after this. <laughs> 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 Become self-sovereign. <laughs> Wyoming has some good ranchers, that, that's for damn sure. Um, all Texas right. has better ones, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, I, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, go right ahead, sir. Hi, thank you. I'm Matt from Tampa, Florida. Uh, nice to everybody to come to our state. Um, my question is, back on the power and the mining, do you all see, do, do see people or um, power companies going to mining to use that excess energy that they create that just goes into the earth? That's a great question. Uh, in Texas, there's a lot of peaking power plants. And when I learned the business model, it just hurt my brain. You have companies that build huge infrastructure that are on for 10 or 20 days a year, and then have these heat rate contracts that are like commodity forwards for later. That's how they pay their bills and get financed. And, and there are, there's a lot of, oil companies here walking around Exxon Shell, a few others that are now exploring those kinds of things to have like an on-prem base load to do like a internal demand response and bouncing off their base load. Um, the problem is the those like hercos and heat rate contracts around those kinds of assets are like 10, 20 years long. So it's a very big deal to break those to be able to then just insert a, a base load in, like on premises. So I think people are starting to think about it and wake up to it. Um, there have been power companies in like Cambodia and, and other South Asian countries that have done that. But as far as like stateside, it's a lot more nuanced. And I think like power grids and markets might be more complicated and nuanced not than mining. It's really crazy and I've just started learning about it. So there's a lot of inefficiencies, but there's a lot of paperwork in the way. Lawyers. Yeah, lawyers, yes. Mike, Amanda, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think there's no question that over the next several years, you know, uh, uh, absent specific, you know, contractual and, and sort of logistical from the finance and legal perspective, uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's any question that the energy producers will absolutely, generators, uh, whether or not that's oil and gas or, or nuclear uh, or, uh, or, or hydroelectric, 
I mean, how much how much electricity is wasted as water just flows over flows through dams with the actual generators turned off uh, because there's not enough uh, not enough demand. So there's uh, and there's no question that at those sorts at those times is also when power is the you know the least uh, the least expensive. So you know depending on of course you know your 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 power market you know ERCOT you know New York ISO California wherever depending on how the the the, the, uh, the sort of the market is set up at those times they're not making any money. You know, it's effectively free power, uh, and so I think you know, as a way for uh, these energy producers to monetize assets that would otherwise, you know, are sort of sitting there accruing, you know, whatever whatever debt, uh, whatever debt instrument they've got it financed with, um, it, it provides an amazing opportunity to increase the, the IRR of the entire project, uh, which then helps them to go build the next, uh, you know, abundant energy source uh, uh, to to make the world better. Yeah. I would just say, you know, from my perspective. Vertical integration is the dream, right? You want the power to the mining, and, and then you can arbitrage the market on the energy side as well. So you kind of it, it pad some of your risk, unless they're both not going well. Then you're, you know, you're in, <laughs> then you might as well just lever yeah. all the way up. Yeah, lever lever as much as you can. But that's my thought. I think vertical integration is the kind of the dream for us, at least. Totally. Well, thank you guys so much. It's been helpful. I think they're kicking us off right now. But um, yeah, thank you guys. Thank you guys.